Hi there, I'm Silk Day, I'm a Chartered Accountant and I'm hoping to do some tutorials in financial accounting and reporting and this might help students who are sitting for accounting examinations. In this tutorial, we're going to look at the key performance in indicators when we evaluate the data that is shown in the statement of financial position or in the balance sheet. The three balance sheet KPIs that are used to monitor an entity's progress towards the strategic goals are the return on capital employed, ROCE, the return on net operating assets, and finally the net debt to the EBITDA ratio. In this slide, we'll look at the data the statement of financial position or balance sheet provides. Well, it is a snapshot of an entity's financial position at a point of time. It shows the total assets of the entity, the total liabilities of the entity, and the total shareholders equity. There are two key questions that we need to answer. Is the entity's asset generating a sufficient return or what is the return on the assets that are owned by the company? And how quickly can the entity pay off the, its debts, stroke borrowings included under liabilities? The three KPIs we are going to discuss should provide answers to the questions. The ratio return on capital employed requires you to calculate the capital employed in an entity. The balance sheet which you see on the left hand chart, has been rearranged to show the proportion of total assets represented by capital employed. Capital employed can be quantified in two ways. We have one way which is the adding up the non-current assets plus working capital. And working capital is the capital available for daily operations and is calculated as current assets minus current liabilities. The other way is to look at the long-term funds employed in the business, which is the shareholders' equity and the non-current liabilities, as you see in the diagram. Non-current liabilities refer to the financial obligations of a company that are not expected to be settled within one year. In this slide, we look at the ROC formula. It is a key indicator of how good an entity is making use of its available capital and is a good reflection of the performance of the entity's earnings. The return on capital employed uh, ratio represents the underlying prof operational profit as a percentage of the average capital employed. So the operational profit is also sometimes referred to as profit before interest and tax. And the average capital employed is the average of two years, represented by the non-current assets plus current assets minus current liabilities, or by shareholders' equity plus non-current liabilities. The entity's objective is to maintain the ROC at a level well above the group's estimated cost of capital. The cost of capital is also the cost of borrowings, i.e. the return from your assets should exceed the cost of borrowing. 
In the next slide, we will calculate the ROC percentage using data from the profit and loss account and statement of financial position given. Let's assume that this company, XYPLC, makes widgets. This is the consolidated statement of profit and loss of XYZ PLC and for two years, 2020 and 2019, the various levels of profit, gross profit, operating profit, profit before tax and profit for the year. For the ROC calculation, we take the operating profit stroke loss before interest and tax. We also have the consolidated statement of financial position at 31st of December for XYZ PLC. And what I want you to note is how the balance sheet is structured. You got the non-current assets, you got the current assets, we got the current liabilities. And if we add them all up and sum them up, if you like, uh, we get the capital employed, which is the non-current assets plus the working capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities. And then you have the non-current liabilities, which is uh, had, uh, deducted from the capital employed, and we end up with the net assets uh, for both 2020 and 2019. So let's focus now on the return on capital employed calculation. We start with the operating profit or loss, which we call PBIT. And for 2020 is 36.2 and 2019 is 14. Then we have the capital employed for 2020, which is 288.2. And we also have the capital employed for 2019, which gives us 308.4, and 2018 is 436.9. We add them up and divide by two to get the average capital for 2020, which is 298.3, and for 2019 is 372.7. We then work out the ROC, which is the PBIT, divided by the average capital employed times 100 to get the percentage. And for 2020, we get 12.1. And for 2019, we get a negative 3.8%. In the next slide, we consider the weakness of the ROC ratio. One of the main weakness of the ROC calculation is that the assets and liabilities in the balance sheet includes both operating and non-operating assets. It would be more useful to exclude the non-operating assets from the balance sheet and calculate a return on operating assets and liabilities only. The formula or the ratio and how it's calculated is the same. Uh, in the sense we have the profit before interest and tax, that doesn't change. But instead of having capital employed as the denominator, we have operating assets and times 100 to get the percentage. However, separating the assets between operating assets and non-operating assets in the balance sheet involves making some assumptions. In the next slide, we will consider these assumptions. The return on net operating asset assumptions. First, let's have a quick understanding of what we mean by operating assets and liabilities. And they're used to identify the category of assets and liabilities that are used to produce goods or services. And this would include not only intangible assets, but also intangible assets as well. In calculating the total of operating assets, we exclude the following assets and liabilities. One, borrowings, short term and long term. Different companies finance operating assets differently. For example, if some companies might 
do it by bank loans, some by leasing, or some by equity reserves. Now the point is that the inclusion of financing therefore distors, distorts the comparability between companies of the true return of the operating assets. So i.e. we should leave it out. Another category of assets and liabilities that should be excluded are tax assets and liabilities. The tax charge can vary between companies and is not proportional to the income generated uh, from operating assets. Example, timing differences, tax losses brought forward, losses brought forward, and so on. So operating assets should exclude deferred tax assets and liabilities. Another class of assets and liabilities that are left out from the operating assets uh, and liabilities are derivative financial instruments, example, cash flow hedges. These are used by entities to mitigate the sudden changes that can occur in cash inflow or outflow with respect to the assets, liabilities, or forecast transactions, example, sales or purchases. The gains or losses from these financial instruments are not dealt in operating income, but in other comprehensive income. So exclude the derivative financial instruments in arriving at the amount for operating assets and liabilities. Pension obligations. Example, you can see in XYZ PLC in 2020, there was a obligation of 55.2 million under non-current liabilities. These are cumulative pension obligations due to remeasurement of pension liabilities at the balance sheet date and dealt in other comprehensive income and not in operating income. And therefore we would exclude them from operating liabilities. We we'll also look at cash and cash equivalents. Operating assets should exclude excess cash which can be used to cushion the company against economic downturns. XYPLC has 23.7 million in cash and cash equivalents in 2020 and 24.7 million in 2019. Further, these cash reserves are generating income which are not included in operating income. Trade and other payables, they are part of operating liabilities. Provisions for other liabilities, they very much depend on what the provisions are for. In the case of XYZ PLC, the provisions relate to decommissioning cost of operating assets at the end of their useful life, so are part of operating liabilities. Other payables, again, depends what the other payables are for. In this case, of XYZ PLC, they relate to government grants for operating assets, so included in operating liabilities. In the next slide, we will analyze the statement of financial position of XYZ PLC to quantify the operating assets and liabilities. So, what are the net operating assets for XYZ PLC? If you look under non-current assets, it includes property, plant and equipment, intangible assets, trade and other receivables. Under current assets, we have got assets held for sale. Again, these are assets which are generating income, but will be sold sometime next year. Um, inventory, these are goods uh, for sale. And trade and other receivables are customers who owe the company money in respect of the goods they have been sold. Current liabilities, which are the liabilities, includes trades and other payables. We discussed the provision for other liabilities. It depends on what the provisions are, but this relates to decommissioning cost of operating assets in the future. We also got non-current liabilities. You got other payables that we discussed again. Depends very much on the nature. Uh, but these relate to government grants for operating assets and provisions for other liabilities. Again, these are decommissioning costs and therefore included 
under non-concurrent liabilities. So the total of the net operating assets for 2020 is 29.1 million and for 2019 is 295.2 million. We then have to work out the average net operating assets. For example, 2020, it is the figure of 291.9 plus 295.2 divided by 2 to get 293.2. In the next slide, we will calculate the return on net operating assets for XYZ PLC. In this slide, we show you how we work out the return on net operating assets for XYZ PLC for 2020 and 2019. We start with the profit or loss before interest and tax taken from the consolidated statement of profit and loss account, which is 36.2 million, and a loss of 14 million in 2019. We take the average of net operating assets from the uh, working that we have worked out which is attached and that shows 293.2 million for 2020 and 300 for 2019 then we work out the the return which is based on divided by the pbit divided by the average net operating assets and we get 12.3% for 2020 and a negative 4.7% in 2019. In the next slide, we look at the next KPI, which is called the debt ratio. In this slide, we look at the debt ratio. There are two components to the debt ratio. One is the net debt, which is defined as the excess of total borrowings over cash and cash equivalents. If we look at XYZ PLC uh, accounts and identify what the net debt is, we take the current borrowings, which is found under current liabilities. We take the non-current borrowings, which is under non-current liabilities and then work out a figure for total borrowings which is or total debt which gives us 133.7 million for 2020 and 149.3 million for 2019 and then we take away the cash and cash equivalents which which is 23.7 million for 2020 and 24.7 million in 2019 and that's how you get the net debt for 2020 of 110 million and for 2019 you get 124.6 million. The other component of this debt ratio is a bit da, which means earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and tax. A bit da represents an attempt to move closer to a cash measure rather than an accounting one by removing major non-cash deductions from the figure of earnings. An EBITDA is widely recognized as the cash generative performance in the year. So let's look at the EBITDA calculations for XYZ PLC. We take the operating profit or loss before interest and tax, which is 36.2 for 2020 and a loss of 14 million in 2019. We add back the depreciation and amortization because this is the non-cash expenses, 21.6 in 2020 and 26.4 in 2019. And we get a total figure for EBITDA of 57.8 million for 2020 and 12.4 million in 2019. As I said, the EBITDA is widely recognized as a good indicator of the cash generative performance in the year, a proxy to cash earnings. Now the net debt to EBITDA ratio is a debt ratio that shows how many years it would take for a company to pay its debt if net and EBITDA 
are held constant. So what we then do is to take the net debt and divide it by the EBITDA, and this gives us a ratio uh, for 2020 of 1.9, which is 110 million divided by 57.8 million, and 2019, it's 124.6 million divided by 12.4, which approximates to 10, uh, 10 times. Now, how do we interpret the results? Generally, the net debt to EBITDA ratio of less than three are considered acceptable. The lower the ratio, the higher the probability of the firm successfully paying off its debt. Ratios higher than three or four serves as red flags and indicate the company may be financially distressed in the future.